All right, guys, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, this presentation is called Real-Time Mobile E-Commerce. Um, if you guys are looking for a different session, uh, feel free to, to go ahead and leave. We won't take offense. Um, <clears throat> so a little about us. Um, so my name is Ryan Cross. Uh, I'm the Managing Director of Cross Functional. Um, I'm also the Sydney Community Lead here, um, organizing the meetups and a couple of camps, as well as been involved in organizing DrupalCon. Um, I've been doing Drupal for about seven years, uh, a little over now. Um, I've got a few couple of core contributions, um, but mostly work um, in the contributed space. Um, Jeffrey, <coughs> you may know him as Jeffrey R. or RetroVertico on Twitter. Um, he's got over four years of experience with Drupal and is a maintainer for several modules. Um, he's a senior developer here at CrossFunctional, and he's also the, the main development lead on the DrupalCon mobile app as well. So, <coughs> CrossFunctional, uh, we primarily do a lot of integration work. Um, we specialize in e-commerce, uh, mobile development, um, uh, primarily around consulting, um, development, uh, and training. Um, and we're also a platinum sponsor of the event. So a little bit of background, um, just a quick show of hands. How many people are actually from Australia or, or this area know Luna Park? OK, quite a few people, which is great. Um, Luna Park's a, a really well-known uh, icon for Sydney. Um, and for those of you that don't know, um, Luna Park's pretty similar to like a Six Flags or a, a Disneyland in terms of the, being an amusement park. Um, they've got rides, games, concerts, and events as well. Um, their concert and events is one of the interesting aspects to their business because of the fact that they um, have several venues that they run, um, you know, commercial events as well as public events, um, as well as they've got restaurants, um, they've got a pool, um, and a few other things that they all manage together under the same, same banner. Um, Luna Park is also a pretty historical um, uh, venue as well. Um, it's the it's one of only two amusement parks in the world that's actually protected by the government and is heritage listed. Um, it was originally opened in 1935 um, and it's been a major feature for Sydney's Harbor um, since then. So, <coughs> um, one of the things that they had in terms of marketing and IT, um, they had a lot of really disconnected systems that widely overlapped. So people that were actually doing uh, marketing for the events business versus doing marketing for um, the park itself and other things um, weren't really connected. Um, they also had multiple different systems for e-commerce. Um, so they had an online ticketing system, they had a separate process for doing gift cards, um, being able to take um, online merchandise purchases as well, and restaurant bookings. These were all kind of really disconnected. Um, but at the same point, they had a lot of the same information in them. Um, so there existed a kind of major problem for Luna Park. Um, because of these different uh, disconnected systems, it was really inconsistent amounts of customer information. Um, we had 45, uh, actually 47, I think, different data sources um, that we were actually looking at um, that had customer information. Um, this made it really hard to kind of communicate effectively with for the marketing department. Um, they couldn't actually segment their data very well, um, and they also couldn't really track um, when they were segmenting who was actually responding back to them very well. Um, so really hard to manage any of their marketing campaigns. The, uh, the other big part to their system was the online ticketing system. Um, some of you may be familiar with Seed Advisor. Um, <coughs> it really, for them, works well for their concert and uh, event sales. Um, but the problem was it really wasn't converting well for a lot of their online stuff, particularly their, their tickets to the park itself. They had over a 90% fall off rate um, in terms of actually getting people through the cart. Um, so that ended up being a, a major concern for them. So the main goals of the project, uh, and I should probably emphasize that there was multiple projects here. It wasn't just a single project. Um, but the overall goals were really to kind of allow the marketing team to effectively communicate with their customers. Um, being able to um, segment the data, um, being able to also um, personalize that information in a way that they could actually get a better engagement rate. They also wanted to be able to improve the ability to measure and track their customer experience. So um, being able to see who's actually coming to the park, what kind of um, response they were having uh, on their marketing campaigns was really important to them as well to be able to make their future campaigns a lot more effective. Um, and overall, there was a lot of big push to improve the online experience for customers. Um, 
we did some testing of around their existing system, and most people found it extremely confusing and really hard to work with. Um, and so that was a big part of uh, improving that. So <clears throat> I'm going to cover each of these in a bit more detail, but the overall kind of approach that we took was a very integrated approach. Um, we wanted to, first of all, centralize their customer data um, and make it accessible for them. Um, we wanted to provide an integrated e-commerce experience rather than actually have multiple different systems for them. And um, based off of some other testing, we realized that mobile experience for them was going to be really important, so we tried to optimize for that experience as well. And then um, based off of what they wanted to do in their marketing, we also realized that social media was big, a big component for their customer engagement. <clears throat> so with a centralized customer view, um, this was actually the first project that we actually kind of came on with Luna Park. Um, it's probably a bit surprising for anybody who knows Civi CRM to actually see it used in a very strongly commercial context. Um, Civi CRM is um, uh, open source CRM primarily aimed at the nonprofit sector um, for um, membership engagement and, uh, and kind of fundraising opportunities. It's, it tends to be where it actually strives or um, excels. Um, <coughs> But Civi CRM actually was chosen mainly because of the fact that it had the ability to have a uh, relationship um, tracking feature uh, for families, which was really important to Luna Park. They wanted to be able to track when um, their mom comes to Luna Park with their three kids. Um, and it made it really difficult to kind of um, do that with traditional CRM software because of the fact that um, the kids, even though they may have their own email address, you couldn't actually use the email address as a unique identifier because the mom would often put the email address um, in the same field for all, all five people or whatever. Um, so we had to come up with some unique ways of kind of tracking that. Um, and the first pilot project that we did with them was to actually take about 10 of those uh, data sources that they already had um, and implement those into Civi CRM. Um, you know, we ended up setting up custom fields for each of the different sources. Um, and also tracking the authority of each of those different data sources within Civi CRM. So it wasn't necessarily, some of the data sources were going to be um, kind of uh, archived and um, deprecated over time, but we wanted to make sure that we could maintain the, de the integrity of the system overall as well, so that um, if you were looking at a piece of information and it conflicted with a different system, you would still be able to kind of backtrack to where that information came from and see which was more up to date or which was more accurate. So <clears throat> this was kind of the next big piece, the integrated e-commerce, and this is going to be, to some extent, what we focus um, most of the talk on um, in terms of the technical side. Um, the integrated e-commerce system um, primarily consisted of taking um, that Civi CRM system that we had built, um, as well as um, Drupal using Drupal Commerce module by, um, by Commerce Guys. Um, as well as then integrating that with the right access system called Sanyo. So <coughs> uh, Drupal, um, there wasn't really um, a huge amount of custom work on in terms of the Drupal side of things. Um, we really tried to focus more on the actual commerce side um, and the user interface side of things. Um, the difficult part then was actually then trying to figure out how all of that was going to then tie back into the right access system. Um, so Sanyo is a company that actually operates all the tills at the park um, and have the ability to actually determine whether or not that, um, that person or that ticket has access to that particular ride because of the fact that Luna Park has uh, different height requirements for the different rides and that's embedded in the ticket uh, access control. So. <coughs> Through some various bits of research, um, not only um, talking with the marketing department, um, but also talking with users as well, um, we realized that you know mobile, particularly in the hospitality sector, is a really major um, focus for them. Um, they've got a huge engagement on mobile, and that was another big part of why the existing ticketing system wasn't working, is that it didn't work at all on the mobile. There was a lot of things that were broken. Um, there definitely wasn't a mobile optimized experience. Um, and that was a big fall off, a big part of the fall off rate as well. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> the last little bit of this um, piece as well was then how to actually engage with the customers um, in, a, in a social way as well. 
Um, so um, Luna Park actually worked with a marketing uh, company called Centric Solutions um, to develop this concept of my experience. Um, and the idea basically was that um, someone would actually be able to come to Luna Park, uh, register their ticket for kind of online rewards, um, and then Luna Park would be able to track that customer um, throughout the park using an RFID tag. Um, once they've actually then tracked them, the customer would be able to share things through their, um, their My Experience account. So for example, when you would get off of a roller coaster, um, you'd be able to see your photo that would have been taken of you um, and be able to share that directly onto your Facebook. Um, and that wouldn't actually cost the, the customer anything. Um, but then the idea is that not only does uh, that get shared and improve the experience for the customer, but it also gets Luna Park's brand out into social media. And then you'll see other people's friends experience that um, on social media and hopefully complete the circle to come back to Luna Park again. So I've got a short little video. This was a promotional video that Luna Park did that probably explains this experience a little bit more. Fun is all about sharing. Sharing heaps of stuff. Like the latest apps, cool pics, life's unfun moments, and all the good times chilling with your best mates. You're totally set up for it with your smartphones and stuff. And now being able to share your experience at Luna Park is really easy. Enter the wrist code. Okay. All right, okay, I'm in. Great. Cool. Now yeah, link it to me. It's all connected. Awesome. Awesome. What? Awesome. So why wait to tell your friends what you've been up to when you can share it in real time? Can we upload this on Facebook? Yeah, you can. Really? Hey guys, let's just upload it. Oh, your hair looks completely ridiculous. And simply swipe your wristband to update your status. Hey, 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 I got a two for one offer. Oh, great. Oh, hey, this photo's got six likes and 14 comments. Already? At the end of the day, you'll get an email with your Extremometer rating. I'm an email, Extremometer. Oh, Michael, you win. Yeah. 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 Eight out of ten. Awesome. Eight out of ten. Enhance your experience with my experience at Luna Park. So, <clears throat> as I said, that was the, uh, the my experience part of um, the, uh, the marketing department. The other aspect of it was the... Uh, Actually, you know, that's the in-park experience. Um, we wanted, obviously, then to be able to get more people to the park. Um, and a big part of that was then the actual e-commerce side of that. So um, the idea was to push this, uh, um, this kind of mobile optimized experience so that instead of actually standing in line waiting to get into the park, um, you'd be able to actually, um, again, for those of you that are familiar with it, um, you can actually get to Luna Park um, by crossing the, the harbor on a ferry. So the idea is that you can actually um, get on the ferry to Luna Park, um, and in the few minutes that it actually takes you to actually cross the, the harbor, you can actually go through the checkout process, and by the time you get off, everything's ready for you. All you have to do is scan your, your, um, the barcode on your phone to be able to then get access to the park. Um, otherwise, we had problems with, well, Luna Park had problems with the fact that on really busy days, sometimes people will stand in line for up to two hours. Um, so. <clears throat> The main results of this kind of integrated approach were, were really pretty powerful. Um, we, uh, we worked with them to kind of deliver this integrated marketing platform. Um, they actually won an award for the best digital marketing campaign um, from the International Association of Amusement Parks. Um, <clears throat> we also saw, um, based off of our initial testing, an improved customer experience. Um, the initial testing, and I, I should probably clarify here, the reason why we don't have more concrete um, uh, results at this point is we've had a few hardware delays. So it hasn't actually launched yet. Um, it should actually launch, uh, at least the e-commerce side of this should launch in about a month. Um, but the initial testing suggests that about 80% or more of the customers can successfully complete the e-commerce without any additional assistance um, and should really drive um, the conversion rate a lot higher. Um, <clears throat> As I said, the conversion rate for a lot of this stuff is still to be fully tested. Um, but the main improvement for a lot of this for Luna Park is that it really reduces the wait time for customers. Um, and a big part of that as well is it reduces their load on staff and resources, 
by and, and thereby increases the customer throughput that they can actually get into the park at any given time. So, <clears throat> uh, I'll do a quick stop right now. Um, I've gone through this pretty quickly because I want to give a lot of time for, for Q&A and also for a demo a bit later. But before I switch over to Jeffrey, is there any questions on what I've covered so far? No? Okay. All right. Thank you. Look, ah, good. Okay, so right, there are several different components. As we said before, the so the core of the e-commerce site was built on Drupal Commerce, and we had to sort of sort of customize and build some custom components to sort of make it work with the external Sanyo system, but we also had in mind to do a few things specifically to target this mobile experience. Okay, the Sanyo API is sort of a, it's an external, external system that we sort of talk to from our end using a custom built sort of SOAP library. Well, well, the actual SOAP library itself was sort of off-the-shelf PHP software, and we just built some custom PHP classes to talk to it, sort of to run the run the various functions that needed while well, running. Actually, the aim of this was to sort of simplify the process as far as the API was concerned, so that could make the minimum number of transactions between the Drupal site and the API. This would sort of cut down on number of points of failure and would ensure that we would have a more sort of a more consistent experience from a developer point of view. In the beginning there in the beginning if I recall correctly there wasn't actually an API to begin with. Uh, we actually ended up designing the API to integrate with Sanyo. Um, Sanyo is a, a .NET based system um, built on Microsoft uh, SQL and um, a bunch of other custom proprietary software. So we designed an API um, uh, on top of that, um, which then we got the Sanyo implementers to, to write and expose to us rather than actually um, connecting directly to the database and manipulating things um, to make sure that the system was more robust long term and more maintainable. We wanted to ensure that there was an API for us to work with rather than trying to manipulate database tables directly. Of course, between the design and implementation stage, there were a number of changes, so we looked into ways to sort of verify their end of things and to verify that we were using it correctly, so we took a number of steps to ensure this was the case. We sort of developed a couple of ways of visualizing the output from the API at our end to make sure that everything was coming through as expected. And we used the Devel module in some ways there. We also developed various unit tests for the module, for the API modules. We used simple tests to do it. And that was very useful as it turned out because not only did it help us sort of reliably determine whether the APIs were functioning as expected and whether we were using them properly, but it also helped us manage to pick up some some bugs and downtime issues. Okay, using using Drupal Commerce is a major boon to us in that it supports multiple pay payment gateways right out of the box. So so we ended up going with secure pay as sort of our main payment gateway, but we have the option to add many others, including PayPal or any others should we choose it. And what payment gateway we end up using doesn't really matter as far as the Sanyo API is concerned. As long as it verifies that that payment has gone through, that's all good. And of course, we designed the checkout process in such a way that should the, that the customer data was able to be fed into CVCRM with the, the requisite indicator of whether they want to be signed up to any mailing lists or anything like that. 
should just note as well that the original spec also, and the big reason for the multiple payment gateways being useful is that um, Luna Park wanted the ability to have the customer allow, uh, choice of different payment gateways as well. So we've, we simplified that for the first launch, but they're going to roll out um, a couple of different payment options um, in the future. Now, for the mobile experience, we actually ended up formulating a particular, particular form of design that was a little bit more than a normal responsive design. And this, I guess we've called responsive design extreme, and it's a combination of different things that are informed by multiple different methods. We were fortunate enough to be able to do a round of user testing based on the initial well, the initial layout of the site, and we were able to determine a couple of bits of crucial information, one of which is that, in particular, kids seem to be have an innate understanding of a lot of the sort of the conventions of the web, but but unfortunately the people with the purchasing power are not quite as blessed. So in a sense we had to work at providing some alternate visual cues to sort of help people continue through the continue through the checkout process. This would help to sort of reduce friction, hopefully increase conversion. As far as the mobile side of things went, we chose a methodology based on RES, which, is, which expands to responsive design plus server-side components. This is because, well, we, we determined that while responsive design is really fantastic in terms of sort of resizing and rebuilding content-based things, it's not necessarily, it doesn't really suit the way that various application-based sites work, and this definitely being a very much app-style-oriented or, app experience, sorry, this was something we wanted to find ways to improve on. And so, therefore, we tried to figure out ways to optimize the experience for mobile users, including sort of providing more touch-oriented cues, sort of reducing the number of fields, various indicators to ensure that users received more consistent feedback on what was happening. And we also ended up building a number of little JavaScript-based tools that would help to emulate a native app experience, for instance. Let's say we have an have a bunch of markup that essentially renders an accordion on the desktop version, on the mobile version, that will render out as a list of links. And when you click the list of links, an overlay will pop in from the side showing the content of that accordion pane. And a similar we got a similar thing to work for forms too. We were able to break it up based on field set and use the headings as links that would essentially pop in the individual components of the form in those field sets as overlays. And I'll be demonstrating them a bit later. The one other thing I just want to stress that's probably not obvious is that this kind of technique allows the ability to actually have a significantly different experience on the mobile um, size browser rather than the desktop based versions. Um, but you're still actually using the exact same system in terms of content and delivery, um, but you've got that optimized experience. And that's why we went with this approach. Okay, the, okay as far as the checkout goes, we had to do a fair bit of initial data modeling to account for the the pricing structure of the tickets and to account for the various upgrades and offers that Luna Park wanted to offer. So we, so we set out various pricing rules based on taxonomy, various ways of grouping tickets together. So for instance, we had a particular taxonomy that sort of dictated the particular height that belonged to a particular ticket. And we also defined uh, another taxonomy that corresponded to the period of the year. Now, this, this pricing period could sort of be defined as being a peak period or an off-peak period. And whenever someone 
selected a given time of year to visit the park, whether it be today or tomorrow or next week or sometime in the next three months, they would res- they would see on the list of available tickets once it corresponded to whatever period was set. Mm-hmm. We also included the facility to sort of offer add-ons and upgrades for tickets, and we we define those using using node references and and other entity references. So we were able to we were able to check when a user was going to check out whether they had a particular type of product in their cart and and then see okay are there any potential upgrades for this ticket are there any pot- potential add-ons and we were able to programmatically display a form saying do you want to add any of this to your cart or do you want to upgrade this particular product however since we figured that mobile users were not necessarily interested in going into depth with their order or anything, say they're on the ferry over and they just want to be able to buy a ticket quickly, we, were, we specifically chose to ignore that. And we were able to do so by using some of our client-side tools to tell the server end whether or not they're on a mobile device. And if that's the case, it would just opt to skip those steps entirely and go straight to the checkout page. And we were able to use a number of different tools to sort of get that, I guess, responsive experience at the server end, including including just some simple JavaScript, de- simple JavaScript client detection, as well as using detector module and a few other things. So, if you want to go ahead and um, escape, yeah. So, this is the uh, the current design for Luna Park at the desktop version. Um, what's probably going to be easiest for us to kind of demonstrate how some of this will operate is to actually go through the checkout process, but actually show how this thing re- um, responds on each of the different screens. Um, so, I probably should actually get out of full screen and then actually be able to change that, and you'll see how. Um, who wants to go for it twice? All right, we'll do it twice then. Yep. Okay. So one of the things that came out of the user testing um, was that because of the nature of this um, ticketing system um, or the ticket pricing structure, um, a lot of, con- of users were actually really confused about how to actually purchase tickets based off of height. So one of the things that we introduced was this kind of um, ability to educate the users to um, to kind of teach them that this is how things are going to go in the future, and if they have any questions, it takes them back to their main corporate site um, where all that information is explained in more detail. But it doesn't require us to actually go through it in the checkout process. Um, but this is obviously something that will be uh, bypassed on the mobile version. One thing to note, of course, is that the height indicator only being relevant for... Um, daily tickets is something we were able to skip entirely if someone decided to, say, go straight for annual annual passes. In a future iteration of the site, we're also going to be launching with merchandise, so this pop-up window is only relevant for daily passes. So this is this is the ability to actually then choose a particular date period. Um, we gave basically a couple of shortcuts for today and tomorrow, and then most of the functionality went into the selecting of the date period. Um, <coughs> this is part of the taxonomy that we were talking about earlier, um, and this actually then allows you to select, um, or based off of this selection, you'll get a different list of tickets and different pricing of tickets.
So you can see here that this was um, potentially a bit complicated because not only do you have different types of tickets, but potentially within the different tickets, you had different options. Um, the way this is actually done is using um, products or, or people familiar with um, Drupal Commerce, uh, a product display node is actually in each um, uh, accordion uh, screen. And then the different product variants are what actually then go um, vertically in that table. Um, and that that is also dependent on the different types of products that we're using as well. And it may sound easier to actually write a lot of this stuff kind of hard-coded and, um, and simplified, but because of the fact that Luna Park is constantly changing their tickets, um, we needed to make a system that was going to be flexible enough that they could actually get these kind of um, displays without having to constantly rebuild them. So you can see there it gets you a little notification that you've added to your cart. You get the cart on the side. That's all pretty standard Drupal Commerce functionality. Um, do you want to show them any of the other uh, accordion pieces? Yeah. So you can see the different types of tickets then have a different type of display. Um, and all of the text is obviously user editable, um, so that they can also introduce uh, images or other kind of marketing promotions. Um, but at the same point, a lot of this information then is actually linked to um, the actual ticketing, uh, ticket accessing system, Sanyo, um, to pull that information in. A lot of these fields are pretty standard um, experiences when you're actually working with Drupal Commerce. Um, there are a couple of unique things. So for example, being able to insert the terms and conditions, um, as well as we were uh, inserting a custom field to actually determine whether or not the user wants to be uh, signed up to uh, various Luna Park uh, mailing lists. I forgot to mention as well at the beginning of the, this, um, all of this at the moment was actually uh, being hosted with our partner Anchor, um, which you may have seen downstairs. They're also sponsoring Triple, TripleCon. Um, however, I'm running this over my phone. So the, the delay on here is more than likely because of my phone internet connection, not because of their hosting. And I'll probably point this out on the next go around. Um, but for those that haven't, you may look at also the checkout process and how the buttons actually change. Um, so one of the other things that we needed to be able to do to improve the customer experience was conditionally change um, what actually um, the buttons were in terms of moving forward and moving back. Um, and so once you've actually completed, um, you always get a nice little checkout complete. Um, now, this particular purchase, we've purchased 20 different tickets. Um, so you can actually download the individual tickets um, as a PDF. Um, and you'll then be able to actually get a barcode, um, which then when you actually take through the park, um, you'll actually be able to scan and go from there. Okay.
I'll talk about a few other things um, as well. Um, one of the things that will be coming in future versions of this as well is the ability to actually have a more personalized um, online experience as well. So right now we're not actually, even though we're collecting all of the information and uh, being able to store that in the CRM um, for future marketing opportunities, um, we're not actually creating an account for them in, uh, I take that back, the new latest version, we, take that back, we are actually creating an account for them. Um, the first version of this, we didn't actually create accounts. Um, but we are creating accounts now to allow them to actually um, reclaim their tickets. Um, but the next version is also expected to have a more personalized experience where they can be able to customize what types of notifications they want to be or what type of mailing list that they want to be involved in, um, as well as um, getting um, games online specifically for Luna Park um, and those kind of things as well, um, and develop the more uh, mature online experience. So this is the mobile experience. <coughs> um, you notice the first page is not significantly different, but it'll, it's obviously optimized, smaller graphics. Um, and things move down below. Um, but now you'll begin to see that things are quite different. Instead of actually having a, a longer table, um, you got, get to be able to actually see um, how these things become list items and use kind of more native style uh, widgets. We should probably go back through and show them how to select how the different Yeah. So you can see this is a completely different style. Um, so instead of actually having just a you know a button or whatever else, this actually becomes a drop down, um, and then you get the same options as you would in the uh, desktop version. But the experience is obviously optimized for touch. Um, the buttons are obviously bigger. There's um, a stronger um, touch element for them. And then you'll see here, there's also a lot of things that are probably hidden, which you probably would have noticed in the desktop version. So um, the little sidebar helper around um, the different height restrictions um, and those things, uh, those have all been kind of hidden and uh, passed away. Um, and when you actually open up the various tickets, um, <coughs> instead of actually having the same kind of graphical issue, you actually then have a more streamlined mobile experience where um, you can actually then pick from there. And you don't actually enter in uh, the quantity that you want, you just uh, add individual ones to your cart. Considering that you're unlikely to buy bulk purchases on your mobile phone, you're more than likely just to buy a few or one. Okay. And you can see the shopping cart is now also moved to the bottom since it's a secondary piece of navigation. And then <clears throat> the shopping cart experience now, when you actually go to check out, one of the things that we realized on the mobile experience is that it's really a poor experience to have the same, even though you still need the same number of fields, um, getting a really, really long scrolling list of fields on a mobile experience is really poor. Um, so we broke it up in a way that allows people to actually enter it in, in piecewise, and they don't get scared about actually having to enter in so much information. And then we visually indicate when they've successfully completed each little piece of the form. So you can see there are the different visual indicators on the right. You get a final chance to review your order, um, which is all pretty standard stuff. Put in your credit card details. And then you complete your order. Okay. 
And so now you actually have a different style of the completion page, even though the information, again, is the same. Um, so you get some information about what is good to bring if you, for example, are not actually already on your way. Um, you get the ability to also um, share that information um, with your friends in terms of social media. And you know, there's more park information. The last bit is to actually then view your tickets actually on your phone and be able to actually then get into the park with that. And this, this is going to be further optimized than before we actually release it. This is still kind of uh, dummy marketing material. Um, but then you'll be able to actually scan this at the park. Okay. I think that covers most of the demo. What else do we want to Uh, there, there was some issues um, that we had to deal with in terms of the standards of the different barcodes. Um, so as long as we actually use um, one of the standard barcodes, it doesn't really matter about the scale. Um, so yeah, um, but we did, we did fight some of the standards initially. Um, so <clears throat> some next steps, as I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of this other stuff is already launched. So CVCRM is already there. Um, the, my mar the My Experience stuff has already been implemented, um, and the e-commerce stuff is developed, but it's the last piece that hasn't really been launched yet. Um, so that's going to be launched in approximately the next couple of weeks, probably a month, um, just when we finish um, dealing with a few minor hardware issues. Um, the other big piece then is then to finish centralizing the CRM um, to integrate with the My Experience um, and other data sources, um, which will allow further uh, kind of in-park marketing opportunities. The idea is once all of this stuff is integrated and tied together, um, when somebody actually um, buys something online, all that information is in the CRM. They come to the park. Um, they'll be able to then um, register for my experience. And then you'll be able to do marketing opportunities. For example, when somebody actually gets off of the uh, roller coaster, um, they've come out, um, you'll be able to actually see and know that they've just come off, so they're right next to the food court, be able to then SMS them uh, a 10% discount for food, and be able to market them in a way that um, can hopefully drive more business within the park as well. Um, so as well as, and that's just one really specialized example, but there's obviously tons of opportunities there. Um, but this often, th this then provides a platform for them to do a lot of different creative marketing opportunities, um, as well as better manage their customer experience, because um, obviously that's the, that's the end game. So, um, that's it. If anybody's got any questions, we've got, um, I think, just about 15 minutes, so we're doing well on time. Yes? Um, <coughs> there was a few, st few struggling pieces. Um, one of the things that was difficult to begin with was that this, the Civi Serum component actually started a little over a year ago, uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, so about halfway through some of the stuff that we were doing with the e-commerce stuff, um, we realized that we needed to actually upgrade um, to a significant major version of Civi CRM. Um, but that actually helped us a lot because the older version of Civi CRM was harder to work with. Um, the newer version of Civi CRM had a much better API um, in terms of the web services and stuff and also allowed us the ability to um, make it easier for some of the future integrations we want to do um, to actually link. So this is connected to um, their commerce website, and will also then be connected to their, their main corporate site. But they've got a set of, I think, about another nine different websites that they all want to um, pull their information into CVCRM from. Um, so that's going to make that a lot easier. Um, however, um, there was also a little bit of struggle um, with the fact that um, CVCRM is kind of geared towards um, nonprofits rather than kind of a commercial side of things. So I see a little bit of um, the potential in the future for there to be some limitations, um, just because of the fact that 
one of the things that they want to pull in is their actual sales team from the events um, department. Um, and because the Civi CRM doesn't really have a sales pipeline kind of method built into it, um, there's going to probably be a little bit of uh, custom software that needs to be written there um, to provide a proposal system within Civi CRM. Does that answer your question? It is. I mean, I guess the point I would probably make there that um, right now we're only doing one-way integration, or you know, in terms of the Civi CRM component. So it's only data coming into Civi CRM, um, and so. But there, and that's definitely the next piece that I mentioned um, for the Civi CRM integration is um, getting a, a lot of these other data sources to come in and actually doing two-way integration for those. Um, that's, um, you know, we, we didn't want to kind of tackle the super hard problem first. We want to tackle the easy one and see if it actually worked well, um, particularly because a lot of those um, data sources um, were trying to cut it down. I mean, um, even, um, even half of that, um, going from 45 to 25, would be a big improvement just in terms of um, manageability. Um, but um, we'll see where we go. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Jeffrey, that's probably... Okay, um, yes and no. Some of the content is just being shown or hidden, and you can do that with simple media queries. We, to some extent, yes, we use simple media queries, but we also use a JavaScript-based method in which we try and detect the size of the browser and a couple of other aspects. And moreover, in the case of those sort of more complex user interface bits such as working with the accordion and the list of items. We use that, we try and use the JavaScript based size detection to to determine what aspect we should be displaying and then we sort of essentially initialize the proper widget for that aspect. And Pretty much, but we try and keep the markup as lean as possible to ensure that it's not there's not too much overhead. I should add one other thing that we didn't actually use on this project, um, but has come out of some of this work, which is um, a module we contributed back to the Drupal community called Detector, um, and it's a really cool little module um, for doing some of this stuff because it allows you to um, detect different properties of the browser, and screen size is one of them, and then conditionally um, change what you're going to do. So we've built in the ability to actually um, alter it based off a of context module, um, and I think there's also some rules integration as well. Um, so you can do a lot of kind of really basic things using that um, without a whole lot of additional effort on the front end if you want to go down that path. Still need to do a bit of work on it before it's ready for prime time there. Okay, the price variation with taxonomy um, is probably explained like this. The Essentially, we have several different variations of product per sort of product display, if you will. The product displays are a type of node, and the product variations are essentially a comma-specific entity that are linked from the product display. And we have different prices on all those variations, and that's pretty much how we are able to sort of modify the price like that. You would able to, you would be able to do the same sort of thing by, say, having, say, if you're selling cushions or something, if you want to sell different sizes, you would set up size as a given taxonomy and assign different terms to your different product variations. You could do the same with colors or 
pretty much any other property you feel like. Uh, I think one of the things that you may also be asking about is how does the taxonomy choice then drive the tickets? Um, the taxonomy choicing that we're actually doing is actually based off of the date. And so the all of the different prices are represented as different variations. We're not actually changing the price based off of the taxonomy. It's the other way around. Based off of the taxonomy that they choose, we then choose or we selectively display different product variants that they use. Okay. Yeah, there was a few things. I mean, we, we actually had a big debate about the upgrade and add-on process and whether we should completely remove it um, at all um, and kind of try to do it maybe only in like a sidebar kind of thing. Um, but at the same point from the commercial side, um, Luna Park, that became something that they really wanted to actually have. Um, so we did our best to really um, minimize the number of clicks um, but also needed to make it a bit flexible so they... There's basically, um, the basic case right now is that any ticket that you actually buy, um, they want to give you the option um, to actually upgrade it to an annual pass. Um, and it's actually, I mean, it makes commercial sense even from a consumer perspective because buying a ticket to, like a standard ticket is like $49 or something like that and getting an annual pass is $99. So if you're going to go there m at all more than once, it definitely makes sense. Um, and a lot of, and that was part of the research that we found is that a lot of people, because they have all these different pricing things, a lot of people got really confused. So in some regards, actually presenting them the upgrade um, was actually a benefit to them. Um, we had somebody actually come through our user testing who had been to Luna Park like 10 times over the last two years. And so it was obviously very familiar with Luna Park. And she had no idea that she could actually save so much money by getting uh, an annual pass. And she only found that out after going through our user testing and realized, oh, there's this option to do this. And I've been doing it this way for so long. So um, from that perspective, we kind of, that's how we went down that path. Does that answer your question? There was, uh, on to that point as well, the one thing that, that probably did influence that was the completion page. Our initial completion page was, particularly for the desktop, was a lot more informative. There was a lot more links to other things in the park and information, that kind of stuff. And after we kind of really like stripped out a lot of that stuff for the mobile version, um, we kind of went back and looked at the desktop version and was like, wow, this is way too much. Um, and so there was definitely there stuff there that we pulled out. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you speak up? So the question is, sending the tickets to Passbook on the iPhone? Um, no, we didn't, um, or at least not yet. Um, it's definitely something I guess we, we can look at. Um, but that being said, um, one of the things we really wanted to make sure with this approach as well is that um, it's kind of device agnostic. Um, so, um, you know, the way, for example, that we did the DrupalCon mobile app, um, we actually did a lot of this stuff based off of HTML in the back end, but then each platform has their own build. It was really important for us to be able to give this experience to users um, without necessarily having to determine or, or lock them to a particular device. Um, so again, kind of a small example. We didn't expect this at all, but in part of our user testing, somebody happened to come in um, with a BlackBerry, um, which is something we had not even factored into our requirements at all. Um, and he pulled it up, and it more or less worked fine. There was a few small CSS tweaks that we needed to do just on um, a few little buttons and stuff, and that was that was it. Um, so we were really excited to see that um, that kind of cross-device opportunity was there. But I will look into the, the playbook. Any other questions? No? Who wants to go to Luna Park? Sorry, was there a final question there? All right. Well, if anybody really, if anybody really actually is interested in going to Luna Park, um, we'll definitely kind of arrange something. Um, we'll, um, I'll talk to um, to the guys there and see if we can actually get something organized for later this weekend. Um, I'm sure they'll be.
happy to have us. All right, well, that pretty much wraps us up. We've got about two minutes left, unless there's any final questions. Okay, great. Thanks, guys.